Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY, and thank you for taking time out on that beautiful uh, a day um, that is uh, happening here in New York. I hear some music, but maybe that's intended, yeah? No, it is not, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, that was ridiculous. So, um, so, and we are here really, truly really celebrating a great a movement of theater, a movement that really has influenced uh, a global theater, world theater. It was born in New York City, it's still ongoing. It's the Theater of the Ridiculous and the Ridiculous Theater Company. So, a big applause for everybody who came up here. And um, I would like to uh, say thank you to John Jasseron, who also came to me and said, Frank, you have to do something about this. Everett, who worked uh, really a lot of it, our team, Rebecca, everybody, also Black Eyed Susan, who is with us here, so maybe. <laughs> we'll <look at> <laughs> We do bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater, and we are really, truly honored and, uh, and humble that uh, we were here to, there to show this evening, and thank you really all for, for coming out. Also, we'll then come the Mabu Minds, so thank you for coming, and uh, <laughs> Living Theater is over there, um, and so uh, it is, as you can see, such a, a significant evening. So I would like to ask uh, Sean to give us, who has a book that is upcoming um, on, the, uh, on Charles Luttem and the Ridiculous Theater. So he's give us a 10, 10 12 minute um, introduction um, about the, uh, the world of the theater, since we do bridge academia and professional theater. So uh, he, this is, a, you see it in action and emotion. Thank you, and then Everett uh, will we'll take over. And thank you all for coming, and I think this will be quite a unique and really significant evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Wow, microphone. Um, it's so thrilling to see such a huge uh, audience here for this, so thank you for coming. If you don't mind, for just a moment, imagine that you have the queer power to travel through and across time, backward, forward, side to side. You close your eyes and click your ruby slippers. No, your pony hair cha-cha heels. No your patent leather fuck me pumps. <laughs> well, whatever makes you feel fabulous, one, two, three times. In a flash, you are transported to the West Village of Manhattan in April 1970, where Charles Ludlam and his new ridiculous theatrical company, or the RTC, are about to perform their play Bluebeard at a gay bar called Christopher's End. This dive is so named for its location at the far end of Christopher Street, though the double entendre is quickly evident. The bar is filthy and raucous and exciting. The playing space at Christopher's End is simply a collection of rickety boards laid across the bar with a painted drop of beakers and vessels suggesting a mad scientist's lair. You are packed tightly into a crowd of young, handsome men some in leather, and all in dungarees. The men openly flirt and cling to each other lustfully. The spirit of the Stonewall riot hangs in the thick spring air, and the sparkle of disco is only taking shape on a distant bandana-hued horizon. Disregarding any kind of union rules, for this is off, off, off Broadway, the play begins very, very, very late. The plot quickly descends into a depraved tale that unapologetically hurls gothic horror against B-movies, wrapped around the core of Perrault's fairy tale, with Bartok's opera Bluebeard's Castle, Wells' Island of Dr. Moreau, and a dash of Marlowe's Faustus thrown in. <laughs> this production collages sources liberally and sometimes violently into an exciting new work. As the titular character, Baron Kanazar von Bluebeard, Ludlam leads the company, intensely committed to his dream of creating a third gentler genital. He is brash and charismatic, boldly displaying an electric blue beard and eventually a nest of pubic hair dyed cobalt to match. The audience is enchanted, whooping at all the inside queer jokes and unafraid to break the fourth wall with a game of call and response, spurred on by a spirit of drunken revelry and Ludlam's occasional winks to the crowd. 
Although his troupe has gained a cult following over the past three years, this is just the beginning. I first discovered Charles Ludlam in an LGBTQ theater class during my doctoral work at Tufts University. I found Ludlam's plays, written in the style called The Ridiculous, crass and raucous and esoteric. Plays like Turds in Hell, Bluebeard, Camille, and The Mystery of Irma Vep were confusing and brilliant, like nothing I had ever read or experienced in live performance. As I would come to find out, these characteristics are the very hallmark of the ridiculous style. My classmates largely disliked and dismissed the work as incoherent, but I was hooked. Soon after, I voraciously devoured Ludlum's 29 plays from a tattered volume that I found in the basement of a used bookstore. Sadly, I was only seven when Ludlam passed away. And growing up on a potato farm in northern Maine, I never had the opportunity to see him perform live, let alone access to any professional theaters. Not to pretend that I would have understood his plays as a child. <laughs> Soon after reading the plays, as well as David Kaufman's incredible biography, Ridiculous, I knew that as a scholar and an artist and as a gay man, I longed to become part of what I realized was a secret, elusive, and exclusive club, the ridiculous tradition. I was even more surprised to find that so little scholarly work was available on Ludlam and his plays, but I also understood how his work could be challenging and difficult to access. Charles Ludlam was queer, a queer. He was a playwright, an actor, a director, a designer, a painter and essayist, as well as a control freak, a diva, a liberator, a homeopath, an inventor, a rebel, a visionary, and an iconoclast. As this list perhaps conveys, Ludlam thrived on enigmatic contradiction. He is best known for refining the ridiculous theater, a distinct genre that is one of the earliest forms of gay theater in the United States. The ridiculous originated in the 1960s in the filmic and theatrical works of Jack Smith, Ronald Tavell, and John Vaccaro. It carried with it a ubiquitous spirit of mid-century gay liberation that was both enterprising, irreverent, and mercurial. Tavell claims to have coined the appellation ridiculous to define a genre that he saw moving beyond the absurd to the absolutely preposterous. As a distinctly American form, it unapologetically juxtaposes high culture, like canonical literature, grand theatrical traditions, and icons of Western history with low pop culture. B-movies, popular entertainments, televisions, and icons of celebrity, with homage, travesty, and perhaps most notably with camp. Ludlam took the early conventions of the ridiculous, introduced by his predecessors, and perfected them, creating a sophisticated theater that perfectly represented the spirit of the times. Though Ludlam was a force to be reckoned with in the downtown theater of this period, today too few people outside of the theater and queer communities have heard his name. Although the ridiculous movement found its footing in the mid-1960s with the early practitioners Smith, Vaccaro, and Tavell, Ludlam's approach to the ridiculous was distinct creating a unique sensibility that allowed the radical world of the period to coexist within the escapist world of theatrical performance. In turn, building a united queer community and communitas that encouraged public visibility on the streets and in the media. Ludlum's Ridiculous was created in an alternative ambivalent gap that eschewed normative hierarchies and values for a queer collectivity a queered version of the world that demonstrated its live and let live creed through live performance. From these performances, social bonds, excuse me, social bonds were formed that assisted in recruiting the numbers that would make the gay liberation movement a highly visible and united front, a force to be reckoned with. In short, the ridiculous helped to bring gay culture into the public eye. It was the sense of a productive ambivalence, a refusal to be pinned down or labeled into half of a concrete binary 
that allowed Ludlum's ridiculous to thrive in both the theater and beyond, and admittedly in very different ways. Although Ludlum adamantly denied that his work was intended to be grassroots, his voice is too often overlooked, considering that it has helped to inspire progressive changes for the gay community in America for 50 years. In Ludlum's theater, movement towards social change and political progress was directed by a sophisticated exchange of exclusive codes driven by the playwright's reinterpretation of camp. This resulted in a unique approach to a communal and dialogue-provoking reception between the actors and the audience. In forging his own definition of camp, Ludlum was inspired by the novelist Marcel Proust, whose work was to move camp beyond aesthetics to become a guiding principle, or more specifically, a special view of things upon which his tactic to both forcibly and ambivalently throw the audience between worlds of reality and fantasy is based. Ludlum's understanding of Proust is the seed for his personal reinterpretation of the ridiculous, with camp as its modus operandi. In his essay entitled, Camp, Ludlum clarified this vision, and he said, Camp had a homosexual usage. Proust explains it very clearly. In remembrance of things past, there's a long section where Proust describes camp as an outsider's view of things that other people take totally for granted. Because of the inversion, everything that everyone else has taken for granted isn't true for you. Suddenly, things become funny because you're seeing it through a mirror, a reverse image. Camp became a sly or secret sense of humor that could only exist to a group that had been through something together, in this case, the gay world. Ludlum reflected his own time through his own lens, that of an openly gay man during the period of sexual liberation. And he defined the purpose behind his mission in writing, and he wrote, the ridiculous theater is a theater that gives a forum to widely express unpopular nonconformist points of view, thereby preserving a spirit of independence and the importance of the individual. Ludlum's individualism was grounded in his homosexuality. His approach to gayness in both the aesthetic and concept of the theater was as a safe space. He said, gay people have always found refuge in the arts, and the ridiculous is notable for admitting it. The people in it never dream of hiding anything about themselves that they feel is honest and true. Thus, the original RTC was a forum for queer expression without proselytizing or attempting to convert the audience. Well, Ludlam was hardly arguing for people to come out of the closet, his theater invited people into a closet of queer fantasy and performance. Gay became normalized at the RTC, and as raucous and wild as the early shows were, there was a sense of calm in contrast to the riots erupting on the streets. Though the basic form of the ridiculous remains primarily the same, social, social change and personal tastes alter its current and ever-changing appearance. Because the sometimes sporadic and liberal nature of the independent artistic process may overlook its place in the family tree of a genre, like the ridiculous theater, I personally believe it is the responsibility of the theater historian, like myself, to untangle the paradoxes and critically analyze the transcendence of time in order to make a concrete record of this theatrical legacy. I suggest that to watch a neo-ridiculous play and grasp its Proustian subtext is to reconnect viscerally with the origins of the gay liberation movement and the intricate connections between politics and queerness and art. In the climate of its origin, Ludlum's theater was a catalyst for change. But in using a codified language to speak exclusively to a queer audience in an ontologically queer space, his work was also separatist and esoteric, both queerly ambivalent and queerly contradictory. Since Lud Ludlum's passing 30 years ago this year, advancements in civil rights paired with community visibility have forever altered marginalized gay identity in America and beyond. Ludlum was an inheritor and a transmitter of classical theatrical traditions 
as he created original work through a pastiche of queer themes and culture. The style of work that Ludlam created has continued in the work of artists who honor his work through the metamorphosis and subversion of that work, a queer legacy that is represented by Everett here tonight and this panel of phenomenal artists who are joining us, so thank you.
something of a king. <laughs>
I too have borne you nine little ones. Out of my asshole, <laughs> one to rule each planet. Oh, my love, my light, where are my sons? <coughs> Would please you eat? Would please your highness feed? Go, fetch them hither to us presently. Tamerlane, eat. Sing a song of six pence, a pocket full of rye. Four and twenty black turds baked in a pie. Do these have to be my last moments? <laughs> Let me live in peace. When, when the pie was open, the turds began to stink. <laughs> Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before a pink? What? Well, here they are, love. All baked in this pie, which its father hath faithfully fed. Tis true! Tis true! The nine turds of Bacchuset, born out of his ass, oh, leg! <laughs> Witness my knife shot point! Wretch for this accursed deed. Tamerlane, stand back in them! Ah! Shall a wife stand and see her husband's blood? He is tit for tact and death for deadly deed. Alice, stand, Cosmo! Ah! I am slain. Farewell, my boys, my dearest friends, farewell. My body feels, my soul doth weep to see your sweet desires deprive my company. For Tamburlaine, the scourge of God, must die. Cosro, Cosro, Sabina, <coughs> methinks I hear my sister Sabina. Cosro, Cosro, you have avenged my death bravely and paid with your own life. Sucker! <laughs> <laughs> Not what you do, it's how you do it. <laughs> Cosro dies. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil victory win? There is power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the land. The vast majority of men, as well as women, are sexually disturbed as a result of a training which inhibits their sexuality. That is, they are not satisfied in sexual intercourse. What is necessary, therefore, is the establishment of a sufficient number of clinics for the treatment of sexual disturbances. What is necessary is a rational sex education which will affirm the validity of love. <laughs> Life is but a lying dream. He only wakes who casts the world aside. Cosro is carried off in state. The cast follows his body out solemnly. Fini! Or end of play. <laughs> <laughs> Turds in hell. They wouldn't print the title in the Times back. <laughs> It's 
name is the human heart. The theater is the house of life. Woman, the mummer's part. The devil enters the prompter's box, and the play is ready to start. The pimp introduces the whores as they enter. The charming whores, those in which beauty consists, are the tyrannical. Anyone for a little rubber and discipline. The tutu mahooch, the compulsive, the tarantula. Idle speech of in beagles and paradise. <laughs> I will the fen schnapping pussy. <laughs> the scarcely credible, the blase, and last but not least, the empty headed. I may be dumb, but you didn't come here for any conversation either. Orgon enters in a nun's disguise and looks the whores over. Oh, proud fondling whores, in spite of talc and rouge and all the gaudy lipstick, you smell of death. Are you the gentleman from Shirley? Yeah. I have important news for you. You are afflicted with a grave sickness. Oh, what, what kind of sickness? And how have you come by this information? It is an inner sickness. Your body has been filled with the most dangerous poison. I learned this from revelations by the gods. What would you have me do? The only way to cure the sickness is to draw the venom out of you. Oh. You are fortunate in that we are equipped with tools which are capable of extracting the venom quite painlessly. In fact, it is certain that you will find the extraction enjoyable. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Yum! 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 The pimp displays the whore's extractors. <laughs> the pimp removes Orgon's clothes and takes hold of his dick. <laughs> the whores scream in ecstasy when they see Orgon's giant cock and balls. <laughs> they dive on him, and orgy ensues. Holy Toledo! <laughs> Born in a barn or something. Why do you look like a horse? Looks more like an <coughs> elephant's pump to me. I don't think I can take it. What do you think this is? A fucking mite? Come on, spread your cheeks a little wider, baby. It'll fit in there like a glove. I think by the size of that salami, we're going to have to spread ourselves out just a little bit more, girl. I'm sick and tired of working like a horse. Why can't we get those nice guys? Just give me a four and a half inches. Oh, I know what you mean. mean. You're referring to the ones that just barely tickle on your ovaries. <laughs> I don't know about you girls, but I ain't chicken. I should take it. Honey, <laughs> you ain't chicken. You're a cow. With a tool like that one, you certainly don't have to have your box straight. <laughs> if I continue, he will rise up, become erect, and penetrate me so deeply that I should be marked with Stigmata! <laughs> <laughs> Dreaming again, huh? Listen, honey, I ain't never met a man yet who could take care of all of this sauerkraut. But I worship him. When I see him lying naked, I feel like saying mass on his chest. To the heart, to the hilt! Right to the balls, right in the throat. Suck it yourself, sugar stick. The knights are mad about me. Oh, the sultanas. My god, they're making eyes at me. Oh, they're curling my hair around their fingers. The fingers of the knights, men's cocks. They're patting my cheek. Stroking my butt. Yeah, I'm not in the business for love, you know. <laughs> I was in love once and I got the business. Time wounds all heals. I remember that some ten years ago, a beautiful, fresh, plump young girl, the personal chambermaid of the queen, was found guilty of high treason for trying to poison the king and consequently was condemned to suffer the cruelest death that could be devised for her. It was decreed that after she had been crucified, 
She should be kept alive for as long as possible. The sentence was scrupulously carried out. When she fainted from the pain, the executioner gave her a little glass of liquor to revive her. She only died six days later. Her long suffering, her young age, and her robust constitution had made her flesh so tender, so savory, and so sought after that the executioner was able to sell it for more than eight sequins. Eight sequins? Get out! This inhuman market was so thronged with customers that persons of quality esteemed themselves happy if they could buy a couple of pounds. Flesh mongers, all of them. Thinness is more naked, more naked, more indecent than corpulence. Suck a thick of day and die. <laughs> <laughs>
to thy law my services are bound. Why should I stand in the plague of customs and submit for the curiosity of nations to deprive me just because my mother dumped me? Why hunchback? Wherefore pinhead? How come sex mania? Why my form is as well compact and my mind is sharp and my shape as true as any honest madam's issue. Why brand they us with base, with baseness, with bastardy? Why base? Why basement? Why not try the roof? <laughs> well, Orgone, if this invitation gets you on the yacht, Orgone, the base shall grow and prosper. Now, guards, stand up for hunchbacks, for pinheads, for sex maniacs! He exits, doing the shuffle off to Buffalo. <laughs> End of play. Yeah. And now we're going to read next up from the Grand Tarot. The Grand Tarot by Charles Ludlum. Enter the Emperor and Empress. Ever since the accident, she has been going on about it in such heavens of joy. I've seldom seen anyone so happy. I fell, it fell so suddenly. I was in my bathtub. I fear it's badly damaged. Half of it is down. Such gusts of wind. The way they pulled the bushes. <laughs> How did it happen, exactly? The pair of scissors, it appears, was left upon the parapet and caught the lightning's eye. What a dreadful thing! That the cathedral should submit to be struck strikes me as being so strange. It never has before. My maid has asked me if she may ever go over and see the ruins. Age holds no horrors for me, not anymore. Someday I'll have a house here and I'll grow old quite gracefully. Surely with age, one's attractions should increase. One should be irresistible at 90. A few of us perhaps may. You, dear, you will. You used to say it would be in a town with a V. Versailles, or Valenbro, or Verona. The Sphinx spins the wheel of fortune. It is said that if the fool can make death laugh, he will be spared one extra day. Make me laugh. <laughs> I'm not afraid. I'll tell you why. You see, I have no death to die. Make me laugh. Did you hear the one about the man who died and then lived? Died and then lived? He died. His hair. <laughs> <laughs> this one will really slay you. Why did Lothario put it to his girl in the graveyard? <laughs> because he thought it would be a good place to bury a stick. <laughs> <laughs> and not funny. Man. You lose our game of chess. You know, you may be a fool today, but when they come for you tomorrow, you will be a grave man. The fool bends over and death gives him a swift kick in the ass. Touche. I thought you said you could beat him with your eyes closed. Ah, uh, I was at a disadvantage. I had my eyes open. <laughs> the fool has made death laugh. He wins one extra day on earth. What will you do with your one extra day? I think I'll sleep late. <laughs> Now I must return to the netherworld. Yes, it is a touching moment when they administer the last sacrament, the last sleep, the last dream. The last dream? You, do you know the high priestess? Intimately. Do you know where she is? On the other side of the river. Sticks, sticks and stones may break my bones. W will you take me to her? There's a ferry leaving uh, every minute for Hades. Hades? I've heard so much <laughs> about your wicked city. I'll be dying to see it. 
Take me to her. Smell this white rose. You have breathed plague, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, the four princes of the blood royal in the palace of King Death. This is it. Everything's slipping. I'm falling inside. Now that's all right. Don't fight it. Go with it. Think of all the guys who have done it before you. You've got company. High class company. Bonsai, kid. The magician falls into a death-like sleep inside the sarcophagus. The angel of temperance appears, pouring water back and forth between two chalices. Who will carry his ashes under the mountains? Oh, I will. You? Who are you? I'm a thoroughbred mongrel, related to all the earth, and nothing human is foreign to me. And what can you do? I will open the doors and castles of death, and now forever the laughter of children shall spring forth from coffins. All is empty, all is equal, all hath been. I breathe the odor of dust eternity. I will terrify and subvert them with laughter. Give me back my father. Your father lost a father, and that father lost his. Don't you know, fool, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. But I have three wishes, and I want my father alive again. Granted, the sarcophagus opens. The magician comes forward, dressed as a mummy. Congratulations, father. You're a mummy. <laughs> I wish the high priestess were here. Granted. Look at that old beggar woman. She looks like the stump of a tree. This is the high priestess. Oh, no. No, you are old. Old. Oh, no, not old. Oh, will you hear him? In my own young days, I had a hundred letters from a man of darn sight better than he is. They came like raindrops in May. And I had a high head at the time, and I sent no answer. Don't think, because you see me alone now, that I want, I was in want of handsome men in the old days. When Shoshu came to me, she now shot to Takakusa, <laughs> that came to me in the moonlight, and in the dark night, and in the nights flooded with rain, and in the black face of the wind, and the wild swish of the snow. He came as often as the rain falls from the heavens, 99 times, and then he died. And I am still a virgin, ever virgin, ever virgin unto eternity. And his ghost is round me, driving me on with the madness. I wish the high priestess young again. We're out of wishes? You wasted this wish on English pudding? How could you? I hate you, you fool, you, you idiot. He Fa kicks. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Look, the fool has wept a tear. It is a green tear. The star holds up a jewel. I am new at weeping. All the tears a fool can weep will not make the high priestess young again. <laughs> Caruso's Pagliacci plays, and the fool rends his garments with weeping. When the moon wipes his face, his face appears on the cloth. His heart is broken. In the future, let those who play the fool have no hearts. The sun, the moon, and the stars dress the fool as Christ, and the magician as God the Father. The old lady becomes the Virgin Mary. They assume the positions <coughs> of Michelangelo's Pietà. End of play. <laughs>
So I hope you um, can join us uh, for, for, for a talk or a discussion or a panel or whatever um, we want to say. Maybe we move them to the side. So, um, so maybe you have to share some mics. So we give out some of them. Normally the panels are much smaller, so we have um, 11 or 12. And um, Sean, are you there? Yeah, you have a face. So can you, so let's, let's get by the mics up. So um, normally it always works out that I have a chair, but this is a good sign. Um, uh, so, but um, though, let's start off first. Um, congratulations again! I think a, a round of applause and thank you for putting this together. So maybe a question to all of you first: um, What does what does the theater of the ridiculous and the ridiculous theater company? What does it really mean to you? What is it? What is it really all about? Well, for me, <laughs> no, I, it, it gave me a place to be. I, I, like, I've said this before many times, but I grew up knowing that I was different and thinking that there was no place for me. And then I found the theater, and I, I, and I well, the first things I ever seen the company do was Taboo Tableaus, and it was a fundraiser, and it was a, a scene they played a scene from each play they had done for the 10 years of their existence, and I wasn't in the group yet, and um, the first thing I ever saw was Black Eyed Susan doing a Zuni Feinschmecker, the <laughs> rehearsal in Caprice, and I walked in, and my, my world just was turned, turned upside down. And then I watched, they did a scene from Camille, and I had just met George Osterman, Speaking of George, I had just met him that afternoon, and I met him as a boy, and he was a pretty boy. And then I went to the theater that night for the performance, and I met George as Bunny Beswick <laughs> in, in Hot Ice. And, I, and it, it opened my mind. There, there was finally a place for me, and I, I was among like people. So that's what it means to me. <laughs> Let's ask Glennis. No. It's, it means revolution to me. It means people standing up for who they are. It means people not being afraid of themselves or hating themselves, but reveling in the fact that we all are different. And, and that is something that is very important to the world. All of our differences are important to the world. And that's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. I think it was a matter of being in the presence of genius. I went I? to see yeah. uh, Charles Ludlam in Caprice. And at the end of the first scene, he drapes himself gracefully across the chaise lounge. Glamorous, beautiful. The chaise lounge was painted on a backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when I first met Charles, I was a puppeteer, um, I ha and had been a puppeteer, marionettes mostly, for quite a long time, touring all over the country to schools, with ch you know, for, to do things for children. And um, a friend, another friend of mine, um, had met Charles, and I think had been in maybe one of the productions or something. And he said, you know, maybe you should try and see if you can get into this company because I think it, it's really great. And um, So I went down to Sheridan Square where we had our little theater down in the basement kind of thing. Mm. And um, Charles came up out of the basement to, because he'd be, uh, sort of been told that this girl was interested. 
And um, <laughs> he t I, I'll never forget what he did. He took his hands and put them on my shoulders. And he, he looked at me like this. And he, he said, yeah, you'll do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, it was my home for a theater for, I don't know how many, years, uh, 10 years, many, at least 10 years, yeah. yeah. And it, it showed me what theater can do politically and for, particularly for marginal people, you know, which at that point in time, a lot of gay men and gay people generally were. And, you know, I, I think that all of us who were in the company or even maybe even saw a lot of the shows would say that 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 was what it was about, you know. That's what it was about. We are just as good as anybody else, you know. So that was great. I would say, for me, um, I got drafted very at very short notice into the theater. Uh, my first show there uh, as a performer was Turds in Hell, the revival in 1988, and uh, Black Eyed Susan was my mother. In it, and uh, they had replaced John Brockmeyer because John Brockmeyer had been ill, and he kind of disappeared a couple days before the uh, the show started. And uh, Everett called me up and said, uh, "Would you come in and audition for this?" And um, I was or auditioning for Orgo and the Hunchbacked Pinheaded Sex Maniac, <laughs> and I, I said, "Okay." And um, I remember that when I came in. <laughs> Everett and uh, Larry Kornfeld were the, uh, were, were they were directing, and so during the audition, Everett came up to me and said, okay, can I, you read these lines like Sylvester the Cat? <laughs> like, okay, say, you know, what can And so then Everett walked over and Larry, and they came over and they said, well, it's yours if you want it. I said, okay, and two days later we opened. And so I had to learn the role in two days. The thing it's taught me, the ridiculous theater has taught me, was freedom freedom of creative expression. It, every time I got like, oh, I don't know if I could, you know, I didn't know whether, you know, Everett would say to me, just, just go out. You know, we called it Barracuda Theater. You know, just get out there and just chew the scenery. And that was, and we were given freedom to perform and freedom to create. And that's what I got out of it. And from that freedom, it gave the audience a, a freedom to be able to play with us. And so there was a real exchange. That's the one thing, unlike any other show I've ever done, is that at the Ridiculous Theater, you always played with your audience. It was, it was play. It was playhouse, you know? And um, I just feel very grateful that I was able to come in and work with Susan and work with Bill Vare. And I remember, <laughs> one last thing I'll tell you before, uh, was after the show opened and I was playing Orgone, uh, John Brockmeyer showed up one time and uh, he was sitting in the audience and after the show I came out, I had taken my makeup and my giant penis off and, he, and John looked at me and he goes, you Eve Carrington. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my introduction to John, but I had seen Artificial Jungle before and other shows, but anyway, that was my experience. <laughs> Um, I think for me, coming from an academic perspective, but also as someone who loves theater, um, kind of as everyone has said, it's, it is the spark that really ignited gay theater in America. And it all traces back to that. And the book that I wrote is really about Ludlum, but also his legacy. And uh, there are so many young queer performers today who owe everything to the ridiculous theatrical company, whether or not they know it. Um, I think a great example is there's a chapter of the book dedicated to Taylor Mack, and what Taylor Mack yeah. is doing is coming inherently from this to the point where if you went to the 24-hour marathon concert, the final song is called Get Up and Play, right? And it's coming specifically from that sensibility. I, want, I, I don't want to be contradictory here, and I, I, wanna, <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want to um, just preface that, because Charles, did not think he was doing gay theater. He was totally against the notion of gay theater. What he was into, I, and, and it doesn't, I, I think of The Ridiculous as the first honest gay voice in the theater. It was where the queer didn't have to die. Like Charles said, if the queer is gonna commit suicide, it should be for a fabulous reason. <laughs> not, not for, not to, in like 
the, the children's hour and crap like that. With the, before this, the queer had to die. Then it had to die horribly. And in, in these, because Charles said he didn't want to do to the theater what people do to people. He didn't want to impose these limits on people. And it can't be queer theater. It can't be gay, and queer in the, the queer. It can't be gay theater because so many of the great practitioners were straight. So it, it, it's, the, it's, it's, an, it's an honest voice for gay people. And you're right, I think it, it was on the, the wave to Stonewall, but it learned from the people that came before it, the Mattachines, and, and mm -hmm. it, was, it was feeding off of this, this revolution that was taking place and, and getting its freedom from that. And then you get, um, this group, Black Eyed Susan and Bill Bear and John Brockmeyer and Jack Mallory and Richard Curry and, and Lola Pashalinsky, and you get these people and Mario Montez, and, and here they are. They, they didn't know they were revolutionizing it. I mean, they, they did know, but I'll take that back. They did know they were revolutionizing the theater, but it wasn't, oh, let's go revolutionize the theater. It was, let's go have fun while we're revolutionizing the theater. And it has, like you said, it has. Uh, part of the reason we went under is because we spawned competition. <laughs> and the competition was as good or better, and it just it, it left us behind. So. Um, I, I just want to jump in and, and, and take off on what Everett said. You know, I, I came to New York when I was 18 years old, and I was uh, one of those gender non-conforming people that didn't sort of fit in in the gay world, I didn't fit in the straight world, I was sort of in between, and this was in the 70s. And I lived on 10th Street and, um, and University Place in a hotel for like $35 a week. And my friend and I, one night, I had, I had the most excruciating toothache. It was, it, I mean, it was so painful. I'd never felt pain like that in my life. And my friend had these tickets to this show. <laughs> And I was like, I don't want to go. I can't go. He's like, oh, take some aspirin. You'll feel better. And I was like, no, I don't want to go. And so it was just a block away. I think it was on like 11th Street or 13th Street. I'm not sure which, where that earlier theater was. But it was the production of Camille. Oh. <laughs> and the reason my friend wanted to go was because our dear friend, Ethel Eichelberger, was in the show. And uh, we had... we knew him from Rhode Island, and so we went to see Ethel. Well, I had no idea what I was in for. Um, within the first few minutes of, the, of, of, of Camille, my toothache completely disappeared. I had no pain. I was crying with tears of laughter, and, and it, 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 it just struck me. It was just such, a, such an odd thing that I had come to New York and fell into this sort of uh, unbelievable theatrical experience. And the thing that Everett said about the honesty, there was just such honesty on that stage of these people like me, I mean, some of them were like me, um, doing what they really love to do. And it really inspired me and, and kept me uh, in, the, in, in pursuit of you know, some type of theatrical career. And then, you know, lastly, when I, when I auditioned for Everett in uh, Bluebeard um, and, and I got the part, it was the most incredible uh, wonderland of fun that I have ever had any time in my entire theatrical career. It was, it, every night it was a, just a joy to be in that crazy, kooky, uh, intense, uh, amazingly <laughs> skilled uh, 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 performers uh, in, in, the, in the company. It was just one of, the, one of the most wonderful experiences of my life, and I'm so amazingly grateful that I've had the chance to, to do that. But I think that, you know, I think it's, it, it's not, not so much about queer theater, but, but just being recognized for your talent, regardless of you know, what your calling is, what your identity is, or what you're presenting in the world. It really opened the door for me to just be free and uh, to have a tiny bit of confidence um, in pursuit of what I love to do. And, you know, it, it, most of the 
you know, theater in New York, you know, either you were, back then anyway, you were either in the closet or you were playing straight or you, you know, um, you know, and as far as marginalized people, I mean, I mean, we are still marginalized. I mean, we're not, we're not there yet where, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to fool anybody thinking that we, we've made a lot of great strides, but we are still marginalized as queer people um, in the theater and uh, thank God something like this exists. If you want to go, you know. I think we came after. I I, um, I didn't know Charles, mm -hmm. and I actually have only known Everett for about eight years. Um, we did a production. Um, some of us here did a, a did production together in the style of um, the ridiculous uh, Cornberry with oh, yours, by Bill Hoffman. By Bill Hoffman, who Bill who just passed away. And um, I remember being so terrified of Everett on, <laughs> on, set, on stage because he was playing this fire-breathing um, pastor. And I'd never met him before. And I was like, holy shit, this guy will eat me alive if I let him. But then we, we became friends just sitting backstage, just you know, getting acquainted and talking, waiting to go on. He was such a, such a lamb. And we've just been best friends ever since. And, and then he introduced me to all these people, and I've been fortunate enough to do some other readings of, of the ridiculous theater. So maybe a question towards the mechanics of, of the production, the way you produced all together the play. Did he write the play in a hotel at home together? How long did you rehearse? When did you rehearse? Um, how was it finance? And how long did you play? Where did you play? How, how was that all? How was it? How did it all happen? <laughs> in ten words or less. Words no, or no, no, no. We have some time. We have some time. Acid involved. <coughs> well, there might have been some acid involved. No, um, well, I don't think, as far as I know, I, from my, just my experience, the only play that was totally written when we went into rehearsal was Doreen Got for Blunder. That was the only play that I remember that was yeah. a, a total script. Um, so, uh, other than that, the play he wrote as we went along. Like I remember one play, I forget what it was, maybe, um, I forget the name of the play, but the, we would write, he wrote it as we went along. And, and Charles one day said to me, he said, don't worry Everett, it's a great role. Because <laughs> we would have, one, and then one day we did, um, oh God, what was the play? The Exquisite Torture. And I was the costume designer on that as well. And I had $400 to costume this massive show. And then, and as the play would come in, each day you'd get a new thing of the play. And then I, I guess I must have been bitching about how, what a hard job doing the costumes was. And then Susan came up to me with the script one day and she said, the new script came and she said, well, look at what this says, Everett. And it says, she changes for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go find another dress because we were probably opening it. it. You know, so it was, it, it was, there was a, there was a, a freedom and a, a, a chaoticness, but it all came together. So how long was the rehearsal process? Was it the day, evenings, or how, how many weeks? It was, it, I, it's hard to say it varied from show to show, and it was mostly at night because people had to work, so. And the funding, um, I mean, in the early plays when I wasn't there, um, I don't know how the funding was, but then with Bluebeard, that's when the company got government funding, and they got funding from the National Endowment, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know when the state started to kick in, but that was the funding, and then you'd have to fundraise, and make money the best way you could. One thing I just wanted to add too, from I came in when Everett started directing. I had seen Charles, I had met Charles, but I never worked in the company when Charles was directing. And the one thing that Everett always taught us is just work with what you've got. Like one night in Bluebeard, I'm sure you remember that, that the set started to come to collapse in the middle of the scene. <laughs> 
And it just, you know, there was this whole big scene where it, when it goes into the laboratory and the sets just started coming down. Uh, it was a couple <coughs> days after opening. And we just went with it. We just, we, what we did was we all stopped and we looked at the, sc at, at the scene fall, at, you know, the scenery falling down, and then we just went on with the play. <laughs> it's the same with Camille. Uh, Everett was doing a big scene one time and a, a giant cockroach fell from the ceiling <laughs> onto the floor. And all Everett did was he just turned, he's like, and I, and he goes, <gasps> <laughs> and then he went on with the scene. <laughs> That's, and that's what we were taught to do. Just be like, just go with it, you know? If everything's falling down, just keep going. And that was, that was the fun part of production, really. That was a funny night with the roach. Because <laughs> there was this huge laugh. And, and Jean-Claude Vasseau was in it with us. And it was this huge laugh. And it was the, kind of the, one of the sad scenes. And I couldn't figure out what the laughter was. <laughs> and, and, and I was thinking that I was wearing a dress, so I couldn't be my fly was down. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. And then I turned, and there was this giant water bug. And I had this big dress on, and I went and pulled it up, and it walked by. <laughs> and I, 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 I congratulate myself that I didn't kill it. I would have lost the public. <laughs> And I'm sorry, we were doing Carmen. Everett had written an adaptation of Carmen for The Ridiculous, and he played Carmen. And one night we're backstage, a whole group of us, me, Lennis, uh, uh, Cheryl, um, what was Cheryl? Reeves. Cheryl Reeves, and, and Everett had this long, he had this denim gown on that had a long ass train, this long train. And as he's entering this, to the stage, we saw a mouse on the end of his train. <laughs> so it, now there's the four of us, we're trying to get the mouse before he goes out on stage with it, which we couldn't do. And so the mouse became a star of the ridiculous <laughs> that night. But what, what were difficult moments, dangerous moments, complicated moments in the life of the company? I remember a story that Charles told me, and I don't, it was at Tamberlini, Tamberlini, Tamberlini's Gate on 2nd Avenue and like 10th Street, and there was a Wheel of Fortune up on a balcony, and someone was underneath it, and the wheel started to come mm -hmm. loose, and somebody ran and saved the day. That's the scariest story I ever heard. And it was in Turds and Hell, yeah. so, but I don't, I don't know exactly who was where when that happened. And um, Madame here got hurt one day really bad when a piece of scenery fell over and she slammed into it in the dark. That was horrible. I had a, 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 a severe panic attack on stage once. Um, and uh, if any of you have had a panic attack, it's horrible. And, um, you know, it's just, and I was with uh, Julia, and we had a scene, and everything started to sort of go away. And I, all I did was I couldn't do anything. I just turned and walked away, and I was in this sort of state. And so um, the, the Ridiculous was a boot camp for me. And this is like a, a, an example, because I went backstage, and I, 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 I lost it. And Everett went out and told the audience that I was not well. And about 15 minutes later, we continued. And uh, it was the, maybe the scariest moment of my life. Um, and to continue night after night after that. But along the same lines as, as everyone's been saying, um, I went into the ridiculous and it, it expanded my, who I was from the very beginning because when I auditioned for How to Write a Play, um, I thought that I was you know, most appropriate for the henchman of uh, um, the general. And then Everett cast me as the general and I was like, oh, me? And he saw something in me that, you know, that I had not yet uh, seen. 
And uh, along with that, at the same time, I was in this thrust into this sort of this chaotic family, but what in my mind I thought of as real theater, as you know, you just you go out there and you give it your all every night. We gave it our all. And uh, at the same time, I was uh, developing and uh, as a, a gay man. And I had a, a partner at the time who had gone to Juilliard, and he was like a proper actor. And, um, but surprisingly enough, there was instances that he was afraid to be completely out uh, because of fear that he would not get work um, or how his agent might perceive him. And at the same time, I was part of this company. So, uh, it was a development as an actor, as a person, and as a gay man. Um, so, and it was frightening at times, as I just mentioned, but it was, I wouldn't be who I am today without it. I just remember one time, I remember Everett going, we were uh, doing Camille in London, and we had to, to, to make the entrance onto the stage, we had to go underneath the stage, and it was like, the house in Alice in Wonderland. It just kept getting smaller and smaller. Toward the end, we were having to crawl like this, and one night, Everett was going, we were doing the third act, and as we were going underneath, there was this low beam, and Everett bashed his head. And I remember that, that we were concerned. I think, you know, Everett carried on, but we were really concerned, because he really hit his head, and we still had to do the third act. I mean, I, I don't know how, <laughs> you know, he's like, he, but it was, he was in such a jolly mood that I just remember he bashed his head, he's like, Damn, I'm done this. we were all like, okay, Kill my right. mood. <laughs> One night we were doing, I, I came into the company when we did Midsummer Night's Dream. Everett, I was in Everett's master class, and then he invited me to be in the company and play Titania. And one night, um, Everett was playing a character that had to wear one of those Roman helmets, you know, that had the brush on top. And the next thing you know, he comes running into the dressing room. The hat had cut him across his nose and he was bleeding. And since I have everything I need for everybody in the entire cast in my dressing room, they used to call it the general store. Everett comes running in and says, I need a Band-Aid, because he was going right back out on stage. So without really looking, I handed him a Band-Aid. And when he came off the stage from doing the scene, I realized I had been, I had given him a Snoopy Band-Aid, <laughs> and we went on stage with Snoopy right across his nose. So, um, before we go to some audience question, we go, I think we have Susan with us, and Lee, and also John, and if I, if it's possible to ask you, maybe Curry. Susan, give us, um, you know, some memories maybe about Charles and what it meant to you to, to work with him, if that's okay. <laughs> I met Charles Ludlum in college. We were both at Hofstra. And it was a very different time for me. I was very, very shy then and afraid. But I knew that I wanted to act. And I was studying. Uh, we had a, a wonderful uh, scene study teacher. She was truly magnificent. And she was recognized as such. And I was, But I was backstage up at the Hofstra uh, Theater watching a play, watching a rehearsal from backstage. I wasn't in the play. And there was a man that came up next to me, and he said, um, you up in the theater? And I just, I don't know why, how it happened. I just turned quickly and said, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't believe I did that. And he grabbed my hand and he said, well, stick by me, babe. You'll see the East. <laughs> <laughs> so we became friends. And we did a play there uh, that he directed. And my, um, I was a young woman. Um, all my relatives had died. And I was a young woman with my husband, and he, the man that was playing my husband, he was about six feet four, a lot taller than me. And he, um, we both died in an accident, so we go to the grave where all my relatives are, my aunt 
And the people that died stay at the age that they died at. So my aunt is not older than me. She's five years old. Oh. But um, Charles said uh, about that, he said to the guy that was playing my husband, he said, you have to uh, just crawl on your knees. <laughs> and that's what he did <laughs> during that whole play. Um, but you know what, after it happened, the people that saw the play, the professors, they recognized his talent, but they weren't eager to um, say so. And they re told everybody not to speak to us. And it was because at the end of the play, we didn't take a bow because we all died in the play. <laughs> <laughs> so the professor said, okay, uh, nobody speak to them. <laughs> And uh, finally, one woman who eventually went to Hollywood, played on television for years. Um, she was the, she played all the major parts at Hofstra then. She just whispered in my ear and she said, I just want to tell you that I really liked you. I liked the play, but don't tell anybody I spoke to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized when I came to New York and Charles and I met again, uh, we had parted, but we met again, and that time we just stuck close together. And he was just, he was a wonderful uh, director. He was a very brilliant man, and he had the gift of language. He didn't need a, an encyclopedia, <laughs> he didn't need a dictionary. He was just able to express himself so brilliantly, and he was able to direct. And I remember once, a, a wonderful direction he gave me, which I'm sure that Stanislavski used. Um, it, it was in Bluebeard, and he was, I was the young girl, and he was talking to me on stage, and we were rehearsing, and he said, uh, when I talk to you, yes, you're looking into my eyes, yes, but, you know, it's when somebody else is talking to you and you're listening, there are other thoughts going into your, going through your mind at the same time. He said, remember that. It was a brilliant direction. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what, is, what are your memories and uh, your collaboration? Oh, I just, it was a very moving evening. And I just want to thank everybody for uh, all of their efforts this evening. Uh, Charles was very, very important to me and has influenced my work consistently since his death, uh, and he was a genius. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> to the gentleman who gave the academic uh, reading earlier, that I wish someone, uh, hopefully, who is on Charles' side from the academic community um, gets it together to really uh, talk about and give him the credibility that he needs culturally. I think a book about Charles uh, that is really informed is overdue. Unfortunately, the man that should have written it had just died. He was another dear, dear friend, Leon Katz, who maybe you know. He just died in Los Angeles, and there's going to be a, uh, a ceremony for him in about two weeks, and we'll try to get out there. Because he was a dear friend, and we were at Yale together. But uh, I can tell you, Leon would have really written a book for him. And he spoke about uh, Charles repeatedly when I talked to him. Uh, what I wanted to say was that um, to follow his tradition, a couple of people that haven't been really mentioned were Alfred Jari, particularly, and the whole tradition of Alfred Jari, and that kind of classic. Uh, <coughs> You know, gender-oriented tradition. I think Alfred actually had an affair with uh, Oscar Wilde before Wilde died. But at the end, you know, and uh, uh, he's one of my heroes. And all the whole tr commedia tradition, going into the working method, the entire tr Italian commedia tradition. Uh, I think a couple of, but there are so many incredible historical sources that go into the work of Charles who just moved it along. 
I think he needs his place in history, and I hope that someone gets the funding and the time and the inclination who is enough of a scholar to do it right, to really honor Charles the way he should be honored. Well, um, Sean's book is coming out soon in November, so I hope you have some leaflets out, so uh, please do check it out. Then we go to Marvin, maybe Richard, and then John. Uh, thank you. Uh, wonderful evening, and a, a very moving one. And I, I want to, I think the evening would not be complete if without a couple of perspectives that haven't been touched on, but are very important. Uh, uh, one of these is a personal and one is a general thing. And the, the personal is, I have to say how tremendously moving and important in my life the Theater of the Ridiculous was as a straight person. I came to New York from Kansas, and there's no straighter. <laughs> but with a fascination for theater, and I, I, I went to, an early, to some of the early Theater of the Ridiculous, and then I was hooked, and I never missed a production over many years. Uh, and I have to say that for me also, a whole new world opened up. Uh, and, and you must remember that, that the Theater of the Ridiculous also opened a vast new world for the straight community, too. Uh, it just has to be said. The other thing that that uh, that needs not be that has not been said, but but uh, ought to be said, is a word or two about the audience. Uh, the the uh, those of you who remember the the theater of the ridiculous audiences were will remember that they were not like any other audience I can remember for two reasons that go together. One is. Immediately when you came in, you felt you were part of a community. There was a kind of spirit and anticipation and excitement about it, which only grew as the evening went on. So, but that happens other times in theater. Audiences often form solid communities. But what made this community different from any other community is that as the evening went on, uh, and this goes back to the, the incredible range of, of Charles's uh, imagination and work that is all the way from the the oddest pop culture and obscure films to the most esoteric literary references to obscure quotations from third-rate Ibsen plays and whatever, uh, with which meant that nobody in the audience had Charles's eclectic mind and could get it all, but everybody got some of it. And so you had this strange experience that there was a, a continual ripple of laughter and shrieks of laughter from two or three people <laughs> in different parts right. of the house all during the evening. And I'll never forget that, that peculiar kind of community along mixed with all these individual reactions that I saw in every production I saw. Thank you, that was Marvin Carlson, the colleague here, the world's most, probably most foremost leader historian. But uh, Richard, maybe. Well, I would like to add that uh, the title Turds in Hell comes from Bill Vare, who had an aunt named Turzanel. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to always tell us when they were kids, they would say, Turds in Hell. <laughs> And Char Charles kept a notebook of titles and uh, random thoughts, and so I'm sure that it came from that notebook. Uh, like when we were playing Brussels and discovered uh, Stella Artois was a name. I think there's a character in Caprice named Stella Artois because we had discovered that name in bars in Brussels. <laughs> I saw uh, Queens Collide at the at the Theater of a New City on 2nd Avenue, and then fell in love with the company, really, with Bluebeard at the Performing Garage. It was just a mm. stunning big production of Bluebeard. And uh, Charles uh, ran into my friend Bob Jack Callejo at a party, and this was the spring of 72, and he said, uh, do you suppose Richard would do the lights for Eunuchs of the Forbidden City? 
And Bob Jack said, yes, we'd love to. <laughs> and so we signed on as the lighting crew for Unix and brought our friend John Brown along to do sound. And uh, one thing that Bob Jack and I brought to Charles was traditional stagecraft. Uh, he had been having drops that Laura Wilson painted and there were some nice things, but he was really fond of traditional stagecraft. And uh, the first example would be Bob Jack's uh, marzipan set for Camille. Uh, and then there were the traveling versions, which were just drops. But uh, in conversation with Charles, he was working on a film script called Stage Blood. Yeah. And uh, he was talking with Bob Jack and I one evening about his idea for this backstage Hamlet something. And Bob Jack said, well, what if there was a turntable? And that's how Stage Blood became a play from a movie script. John, what you said, you know, you have to do this evening. You know, uh, to tell us a bit what you, how would you, where you, oh. fit in, where you see it fit in the New York um, Yeah, I, I was talking to Frank and I said, well, we have to have something on Charles Sullivan. But um, um, I first saw, the first thing I saw was Caprice at the Performing Garage in 75 or 76, I think. Um, and it really, like everybody is saying, it was sort of um, like the world shaken up and turned upside down. And I uh, remember uh, not being able to tell what was really going on, which me meant that something really good was going on. But there were so many references. All the, um, the whole entire cast seemed like they were completely crazy to me. <laughs> like crazy people had come onto the stage, <laughs> uh, and, uh, which was, um, Thrilling, actually. So, uh, also all the other things that were mentioned, the the references to pop culture, to all kinds of high low culture mixed together, huge uh, influence to uh, so many people because it it it, it um, gave us permission to to do that. Um, the other fun, just a funny thing is that I had gotten to know um, Stuart Sherman a bit. Um, and uh, I was doing Chang and the Void Moon at the Pyramid Club. We started doing it. And I invited Stuart, and he said, oh, can I bring a friend? And I said, oh, sure, no problem. This was very early on. Uh, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and I remember being up in a booth somewhere before the show and looking out and seeing Stuart, and then Charles Sullivan was with him. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the end of the world. <laughs> Charles Sullivan has arrived at this crazy club and he's gonna see this disaster of a show <laughs> that I'm doing. Uh, everything is finished. Uh, because actually, you know, um, at that point, um, to me, the three or four or five uh, uh, kind of superstars in our community, so it was um, Stuart Sherman, uh, Richard Foreman, uh, Charles Ludlum, Lee Brewer. Uh, so it was people like that Ruth Malachek as well. But I mean, all these names uh, were floating around our, what apparently was our own little world. Uh, and uh, they were actually changing a lot of things everywhere else. It wasn't just in our own uh, little world. But anyway, afterwards, uh, Charles was, was great to me. Always so supportive of the younger generation. Uh, never, uh, he just, he was uh, wonderful to to know after that. Uh, and then eventually I got to work with, with Ethel and, and Susan. And uh, so his um, influence just has gone everywhere. People that really don't realize it, but it's, it's really true. So I also, I do think it also influenced uh, television completely. <laughs> there, it's incredible how it's influenced uh, what happens on it sitcom these days. I, I, sometimes I can't believe I'm, you know, uh, to know where it really started leaking out into the culture and all these things were, were not, have been made possible. So, anyway. So, yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, before we open up, any comment or to what we just heard or from, from you guys or? 
Okay, so we do can take a couple. So then let me put the ends one and what up two. Anybody else? So we we start three. Okay, so we start over here and um, so who was the first? It was you, right? So hello. As one of the designers who had several years of great work with you guys, one of the things that you gave everyone who designed for you was the chance to have an audience pee their pants <laughs> at your designs. And that's a really rare thing. And so I found this last night. This is from the 1993 Lisa Bennett and Everett. And Everett plays an evil person. We were very worried about the right wing oh America oh. rising. And he reads a storybook to some children. You might just want to take a quick peek. We did Linda. Linda. Um, someone told me, came up to me and said that we didn't feature lesbians in our work. <laughs> and I thought that that was a thing to take quite seriously. And so the, the play that Mark Bennett and I wrote, we wrote a musical called Linda. And I, I based it on Anthony Trollope's Linda Tressel. And it was the only novel that Trollope wrote that didn't take place in England or something. But I played the Reverend Dr. Charlotte Drum. Mm -hmm. and, and Lisa Herbold played Linda. And she was this closeted lesbian who ran a laundromat. <laughs> <laughs> she was in love with Lizzie the Lezzy, who was the, the train conductor. And um, there was this kid, Grant Neal played Gabriel, who was uh, like this kind of idiot. And I came into the thing to take over the world. My, my plan was to take over the world for Jesus. And the, the kid was, he was a dope. And, but I said to him, I said, you're not stupid. You just got a learning defect. So I, I taught him how to read using <coughs> my <mind> pump. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's a pop-up version of my pump. And when we open it, <laughs> oh, no, oh, how did this pop up? Oh, no, I guess the other one. Keep showing you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and it slapped you in the face. It slapped you in the face, and, it, and the, like the, oh, the soundtrack was gorgeous, and like there would be like a boon <coughs> rally and shit. Oh, and then there was another one with the. Oh. 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 Just happened in Virginia. Oh yeah, Burning Cross. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we were going to take over the world. And what happened, and it was had a forward by Cardinal O'Connor. <laughs> 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 with a forward by Cardinal O'Connor. He was such a fuck to us. Um, and then, when Gabriel learned to read, he became an evil genius. And he became the founder of the Aryan nation. <laughs> and I, I based, there was a scene with, Lizzie and Linda were escaping from the Nazis, from the Aryan nation, and they were on a train, and I stole the scene from a Mae West movie where they're fighting on the train, oh. the, the, and they have, they're escaping, and the, the Aryan nation attacks the train, and they beat up Lizzie. Well, at the end, Gabriel and um, myself, we got crushed by a giant Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Edward. There was um, um, Armitage Shanks, which I, heard, I learned later that, that um, Eureka hated the role, but she was so fabulous in it. I loved her in it, and um, she invented the, uh, what was it, the atomic, the Excrematron 9000, <laughs> where she was learned how to, I read this thing in National Geographic about in the 60s, they were trying to turn excrement back into food. And, and Eureka invented it. And it was a toilet bowl. Talking of names, and Armitage Shanks is a toilet bowl in London. And so I stole that from Charles. And um, she would turn shit into food. 
And Jamie, this was you. You, you won this one because uh, this banana came out. And, and David directed it. Poor David. <laughs> I was so evil to David. But David directed it. But Jamie did the props. And there was a, when she put the shit in the machine, she dropped this shit in the machine and it turned it into food and a banana came out. And I, I thought it should be a brown banana. And Jamie said, no, no, it has to be a yellow banana. And then we would peel the banana and it had shit inside the <laughs> And you were so right, Jamie. <laughs> and the audience would squirm and they would go, oh. Get your, get your mic. Well, which was the second question? Was all, oh, it was you, yes. So I'm going to apologize in advance for being a little emotional. Um, but I think it's an important and sad part of the story, which is um, my best friend um, came to, we came to New York City in the 80s and when Everett refounded the troupe, Jim, Jim Lamb. Oh. And um, he starred in a number of shows with you all. A lot of you acted with him. And he died of age as a very young man um, in this community. And his memorial was in the theater in Sheridan Square. I remember it to this day. And I have... Uh, the story of AIDS and uh, gay men's and our community's experience of AIDS is written so deeply into this group and the role you all played um, in, um, well, it's obviously starting with Charles, but <laughs> across the life of the troupe and um, supporting the community and creating a place where we um, could love each other and um, stay uh, honest and funny during the crisis uh, is one of the most important uh, parts of that history. I became a scholar of AIDS uh, in, in part because of that. Um, but I just wanted to honor um, the community's holding of each other through that crisis. And really all of you that I remember, and Everett in particular, your little role in his life and the life of so many actors who lived and died through that period. I, I just, I, I'm sorry to take it down, but I don't feel like it's a downer. I feel like it's a really important, it's at the heart of this work and it, sh and it, and it shows everywhere. The beauty and sorrow and tragedy that befell our community and is still in our community. So I wanted to thank you for that and for the evening as well. Um, that was an excellent last word. And I think that the, uh, uh, certainly the, the tragedy of AIDS effect on the ridiculous is one of the greatest tragedies. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say something lighter, which is that uh, the, uh, my experience in going to a dozen or more uh, r shows that Charles staged, uh, it's something that happened to me uh, in those shows that has never happened before or since, which is when I came out of the show, my stomach was in pain from laughing so much. Those shows were just a nonstop laugh from beginning to end and it was in, in the stagecraft of them uh remembering black eyed susan doing that strip tease with the with the hand puppet of the <laughs> devil Every, it, 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 there were sublime moments but they were incredibly funny and you just you just uh, i was absolutely in pain for uh, like a whole day after going to see a child's <laughs> love and play every time i think maybe one more and Uh, first of all, I was much too young to uh, take in the ridiculous. I've heard stories from one of my friends who is a part, he's right there. Uh, so thank you. This has been really helpful just to get a, a more of a context, a historical context of what you guys were doing. And uh, for me, that's very important as a, as a theater artist. Uh, my question is, I know that Irma Vep came back, Red Bull had done a production, and Theater Breaking Through, New, Through Barriers is going to be doing a production of Artificial Jungle. Do you know of any other uh, ridiculous style productions that'll be coming back that we can see to at least get a sense of uh, what you guys did and, and how it can live on? I don't. I, I think 
Can you take a mic? Thing that in um, the fall we're going to do Conquest of the Universe at La Mama. Oh, that wow. that's and but we are doing. Um, I was supposed to bring postcards and I forgot them. But for the theater breaking through barriers is doing the artificial jungle, and it's I've been directing it, and we open in two weeks, and it is phenomenal. The, the actors are so fucking great, and it, they're really gonna do Charles proud. So, but I don't know of any beside that. And do, just to close, what are the future of you, the theater of the ridiculous? What are your plans? Do you have lo ahead for next years or the years up? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Which it's, it's, it's what it is. <laughs> Which is a good, 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 good way uh, to go and mm -hmm. uh, to find things out in your tradition. Well, um, I hope you all will stay. We will have a little reception here. I know there are many, many more um, 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 testimonies or comments that could have been done and would, should be heard. Yeah. Um, but, but I also, excuse me, I want to thank Frank and Rebecca for getting this today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it uh, really, really uh, is, a, is a tremendous honor. So thank you. And 50 years, first 50 years are the hardest. So uh, <laughs> let's celebrate. It's a celebration of the life and work, you know, of uh, Charles, but also the company and everybody involved. So uh, congratulations. And, and really, I would like to have a very big standing applause for that company and what it stands for. Thank you. Thank you.